Well, good, good morning again, everybody. I'm so happy to be with you this morning. I gotta kinda get my excitement down a little bit so I can not stumble over my words. So give me a second here. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord God, will you just come right now and use your word and my words to, to touch our hearts and our lives today. Change us, Lord. We ask for your transformational power to be really at work in our midst right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I got a little distracted this week as I was preparing, and at first I thought, uh, you know, I, it's just another one of my distracted moments, but I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with it. So I'm going with it today. As I was preparing, I, I, I found myself thinking about what do people say are the greatest places to visit in the world? This is going somewhere, don't worry. But I want to show you a few that, of what, you know, what people say. When you do the research, you're going to find consistency. Here are some of those places. I did pick them, hand-selected them. Um, because I thought they might get response from some of you, if, I, if I'm honest. So the first is London, England. How many do we have who... Oh, there we go. I knew we had some Brits in our midst. London, England. Big Ben Parliament kids. The next one, uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Oh, my Brazilian brothers and sisters are in the house. I thought that might be. Thirdly, Rome, Italy. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Dina. Where's Chris Vitarello? My, my buddy Vitarello just walked off the stage. He'd probably be cheering. Okay, I picked this one for a particular friend of mine, uh, Rini Sherrick. Crete, Greece. Look at Crete, Greece. Don't you all want to be there right now? I know it's sunny out, but that looks amazing, doesn't it? Beautiful. Um, this is a place I actually got to go um, this past summer with my family on our sabbatical. Thank you for allowing us to do that this summer. We went to La Fortuna, Costa Rica. And that's an incredible volcano in the background. It's a beautiful place to be. And then, now there's some places that not all of us think are that incredible to go, but others might. And, and for me, there's a, there's a place that I absolutely love. Some of you are going to cringe when you see it, but it's the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York. Uh, not all of you would want to be doing that, but... <laughs> But this is actually fun to me. <laughs> so this is a couple years ago. My, my, two of my closest friends and I hiked Allen Mountain in the Adirondacks in, in February. And it was, it was a blast. Then I started looking in the United States. What are some places other than, of course, the Adirondacks that, were, that are some of the favorite places for people to go? One is the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Here's a picture of my family uh, in, in the Sierras this past summer. Beautiful place in California. And then, of course, you can't forget... Disneyland, you know, people think it's so wonderfully magical. Look at that happy family. Well, some of them look happy. I'm not sure. And then right after, they're making fun of my terrible selfie experience. That's the best one we got, and it wasn't so good. And then the next picture, not so magical when your son is getting a greasy turkey leg all over his T-shirt. Not too wonderful, but it's, that's the same beautiful location, Disneyland in California. But I share, here's where I'm going. I share those things because there's actually a place that I want to share with you that doesn't make any of the lists, but I think really should make that list. The first photo you're going to see here is of a cave, and you might think, well, how could that be so wonderful? But this cave is right below a field, which is the next photo, that is called in Scripture, Eremus. Does that, does that name ring a bell to any of you? It's in scripture, it's, it's a solitary place, Aramis. Some of you have been there, I see some smiling faces out there. I think this place ought to be in some of the greatest places you can possibly go. This is in Galilee, you're seeing the Sea of Galilee there. The next shot is a bit of a close up of that, that place on top of that hill, just above the Sea of Galilee. Why is this such a special place in my mind? Well, this is one of the places where Jesus went to teach and the passage that we read today was spoken first by Jesus at this location. Isn't that incredible? That you can actually go there, that it's not spoiled, that it's still, you can still see it and experience it. I wanna give you a little bit of a, a poke, a little challenge this morning to consider. You know, we're going through the book of Matthew this year where we're gonna be hearing about who Jesus is, what he says, what he did, why. We're going through all these different questions. How awesome would it be to step into Jesus' world and actually go to some of these places? Read the words that Jesus spoke in the places he spoke them. Aramis, that solitary place, is one of those amazing places that we would take you if you came with us to Israel. And I want to encourage you to consider coming to Israel with this, this, us this year. Why? Well, I'm going to quote my good friend Adam DePasquale. 
I, I've been quoting him for a few years now since he said this because I think it's so true. He said to me, I would say to the, the people of Walnut Hill, if you want to go further in your relationship with Jesus than you ever have before, there might not be a better investment than a spiritual journey in the Holy Land. I believe it. Talk to some people who have gone. I've, I get to take groups every year, and I want to encourage you to come. You'll see the information right there on the screen now. You can right, I'm not offended if you take out your phone right now and use that QR code to get to the information page to, tr to really consider this. Our trip's in June, as you can see, June 25th through July 6th, and that is my, my plea to get some more folks to consider coming, and now I'm going to move on, but I thought this is a great moment to do it because we are going to be on Aramis, on that spot this morning where Jesus taught the whole Sermon on the Mount and did other things, which I'm not going to get into today. We've been challenging you this year so far to, go, to try to go further with Jesus than you ever have before. And we're going to be entering into a study, I'm starting it today, that, sa that talks about what Jesus says to us, his followers, those who are on the journey with him. And I want to say this is a great investment to be involved in. So let's start on Aramis Heights and let's look at the word salt because that's what the reading talked about, salt and light. How many of you like to watch... Um, Cooking shows. Anyone out there like to watch cooking shows? I, I like the competition shows. They're fun. You know, my, my kids and I like to watch guys' grocery games. It's a fun show. But here's what I've seen as a consistent theme in all of, all of these different cooking shows. And if I asked you, what's like the cardinal sin that you, you will always lose if you do this? Undersalting. Thank you. It's right. Under seasoning. I mean, it's consistent. You think these are, some of these are they're professional chefs. They forgot to put salt on the meat. We know that that's not going to work. My Brazilian friends, you, I love how you do chuhasku, the barbecue, the salt, right? It's key. It's what makes it. But that's, what, that's why people always lose is because they under, under salt things. Well, salt was used in the first century in a lot of ways like it is used today, but even more so. If you do some research on salt in the first century, you see it was, it was so valuable that um, Rome often paid soldiers in salt instead of cash. Not often, but sometimes. Because it was so, such a valuable thing. It was used as a preservative, of course, more so than we would use that today, as a flavor and, of course, to de-ice the streets to keep the chariots safely on the roads. Very important thing that they would do. Now, we can get caught up in the fact that salt, actually true salt, which is sodium chloride, is a stable compound and cannot lose its saltiness. And I've read commentaries where it gets real caught up on that. But I don't think that's the point at all in this passage. I think the point is that salt is intrinsically useful, isn't it? It's useful. And it enhances whatever it touches. So when you think about salt, and we talk about salt this morning, that's what I want you to be thinking about. It's useful. Not a very exciting word, but we need useful things, don't we, in our lives. But also, it enhances things. It brings flavor to everything that it touches. So my question to start out is, is that how the outside world looks at us, the church, those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, do they look at the church family and say, they are useful enhancements to every community they come into? What do you, oh, I saw some faces saying, I'm not sure that they do say that. I'm not sure that they say it either. They should, though. Christians should bring something flavorful to those that they meet. And right before this passage that was just read is what's called the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are a passage that talks about what it means to be flavorful in the, in the eyes of Jesus. So I want to ask us to read it together. It's going to come up on the screen, and we're going to do something that we don't always do, but I'm going to ask you to actually read this out loud with me. Okay? Can we do that? At home, do it as well. Here we go. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, 
for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, the truth is that many outside our church family would not say that Christians are living these Beatitudes out. They wouldn't necessarily say, it wouldn't be the first thing that they would say, that those Christians are more reliant on Jesus than on themselves. Those Christians are very, very humble. Those Christians, they love justice. Those Christians, they're known for their mercy. The Christians, they are pure-hearted people. Those Christians, they are peacemakers. They don't want to fight. They want to bring peace. It's a little convicting when I say it like that, isn't it? It was to me when I thought about it. So I I thought I'd go a little further to make us feel just a little bit more uncomfortable. I went and did some research to find out what is it, what are the biggest criticisms that those outside the church have about Christians? I looked in a few different places and I found some consistency and I kind of went with a Christian author that I think if I mentioned their name, you'd know uh, Carrie Newhoff wrote this and I thought this was really helpful. I'm gonna focus just on two things that those who are not following Jesus, who kind of look in at the church, often would say about Christians. And here's what I, I want to challenge you to, to, to not do. Become defensive. Don't become defensive. Here's the thing. It doesn't really matter what we think people should say about us. It matters what they actually say about us. It matters what they actually think about us. When it comes to our impact on them, which is what we're supposed to be out, but be about. That is what salt and light is supposed to be about, right? Our impact on the world. So it does matter what people think of us, even if they're terribly wrong, and sometimes they are. But I want to tell you, I'm sharing these things to you. Let me just say it right up front, because we must be stereotype breakers. Walnut Hill Community Church, we must be stereotype breakers. Do you hear me? We don't want to be known for this stuff, friends. We don't. The first is this. Christians are judgmental. I've sat with many of you who have struggled with this one. You're dealing with a family member, a loved one, and you're working through a very difficult situation, and you have polar opposite opinions on something that matters a lot to that person. Could be any number of topics. And so often, this is the struggle. If I just love them, aren't I just condoning their behavior? Don't they need to know that I know that the way that they're living isn't right? The first thing I would say is they know. <laughs> they know what you think. And if you have the opportunity to speak with, you, speak with them, you've already done something right. You're in relationship enough that they actually want to talk to you, even though they know what you think. That's a good thing, friends. That's a good thing. We tend to forget that Jesus was really, really tough on the religious, wasn't he? I mean, on the, on the Pharisees, he is tough. But let's not forget, the Pharisees weren't the lost, the sick, the dying, the ones who were far off on the journey towards Jesus. To those, he was so gentle. I mean, so gentle. So gentle, it makes us uncomfortable sometimes. We want, sometimes we read and we think, Jesus, come on, you got to tell him what's up here. But no, he's so loving. Here's what I found in my own life. And I think if you were to to look yourself in the mirror, you'd probably say the same things to yourself. People rarely get judged in the life change. Far more are loved in the life change, aren't they? That's the truth. It's the Lord's kindness that leads to repentance. That's what the scriptures say. It's the kindness of the Lord that leads to repentance. And what's repentance? We talk about it all the time. It's turning from one direction and going an entirely different direction. Our judgment doesn't turn somebody around like that. It's the love of the Lord that does it. You know the first step in peacemaking? Do you know the first step in peacemaking? Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. That's what Scripture tells us. You know that crazy passage about the log in my eye? First, I gotta remove the log from my eye so I can see the splinter in yours and help you to remove it. What does that mean? It means I do a self inventory. I go look in the mirror and say, Where am I getting it wrong? 
Where's the sin in my life? Lord, and, and then what do we re- realize? The grace and mercy of the Lord for me is so unbelievably powerful. Now, when I go, I'm going in a totally different way to that person that I want to help. And, that, and it needs to be that I want to help, not that I want to criticize or judge. Jesus tells us to look in the mirror. Remember our sin before we go pointing out someone else's. That reminds us of our great, the grace we've ex- experienced. Let's not confuse being salty, which means being irritated, angry, resentful, or upset, with being salt. Salt is about being useful, being flavorful, being an enhancement to relationships and communities, bringing love to those that we come in contact with. Our love for the God's created, that is, all of mankind, should far outweigh our judgment. That's the first area. Second, Christians are hypocritical. And this is so appropriate in this context because I think this is what Jesus is talking about when he says, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. And now, again, remember, don't think about Connecticut winters and salt being thrown out on the roads because that's useful, right? We want that to be out there. No, this is a comment on the usefulness, uselessness of something that's lost its, its strength. Now it's thrown out as rubbish, as garbage onto the street. This is the person who says, I'm a Christian, but when you look at their life, you see a phony. I don't know about you, but when I woke, woke up this morning, I looked in the mirror and I said to myself, I'm living for Jesus exactly how I want to be. No, no, I didn't say, don't, don't be worried. I did not say that. No, of course I didn't say that. I look at my life just like you do, and I say to myself, I am not who I want to be yet. And I know that I'm not who God wants me to be yet. But I'm different than I was yesterday. I'm changing. I'm being transformed. I'm experiencing that sanctification, that lifelong journey of becoming more like the Lord, I hope. And Christ is at work in me. That's an attitude that leads to a lot less hypocritical behavior. We're all gonna make mistakes, but I think there's a couple things that we really need to work on because, again, we need to be stereotype breakers. Here's the first one. We need to watch what we say. Our words are supposed to be seasoned with salt. Colossians 4, 6 says this. Let your conversation be always full of grace. Seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. We need to watch what we say in every forum. The words that come out of our mouths in in small groups, one-on-one, online. Watch what you say. Here's the, the theme of the New Testament, one of the major themes of the New Testament that I see. Especially when you read the epistles. Pauline epistles, the letters. First and second Peter, first, second, third John. You see these disciples, these apostles, saying to us, do whatever you can to win people to Jesus. Isn't that true? That's one of the major themes of the New Testament. Do whatever you can to win people to the Lord. Do what it takes. So we can't be something that we're not. We have to be honest with ourselves. And we have to be honest with others about the reality of who we are, the journey that we're on, Not to prop ourselves up, but to be honest with who we are. There was a time in my life when I was faking it. Go back a few, it's not, it's not been since I've been a pastor at Walnut Hill. (laughs) But when I was a little bit younger, and I had a friend, a little bit older, definitely wiser, call me on it. I can remember the moment, I'll never forget it. It was one of, the mo- one of the greatest moments of friendship I probably experienced, someone who actually told me what I needed to hear even though I didn't want to hear it. And she basically said, stop it. You, you can't be one thing here and another thing there. Don't do it. I was shocked. Funny, my mom still stays in touch with her. <laughs> she must have really appreciated what, he- what Heather said to me that day. But friends, maybe you needed to hear that today. Stop it. You can't live, there's nothing in scripture that says sitting on the fence is a good place to be. Being lukewarm is lovely, it's wonderful. No, 
It's, that's not where we're meant to be as believers. And it hurts the kingdom of God when we are there. Finally, we can't make excuses when we know we've failed. Own your failure. Own it. Own the fact that you're, you're a sinner saved by grace. We blame so often, and it's such an ugly thing. No, we, we need to be, Christians need to be the ones who own it because we've been saved and redeemed by grace. So it should be easier for us to say we're failures, we fail. But we have Jesus. Jesus, on that amazing special spot, Aramis Heights, that I showed you earlier, in Galilee, was challenging the audience, challenging us to be salt, and he knew it was kind of an impossible task on their own. Because how many of them that were listening that day, how many of us who are listening today would say that we are living out those Beatitudes? No, we're we're often the opposite of the Beatitudes. We're self-reliant. We can be arrogant. We can be unconcerned about others, only concerned about ourselves. Sometimes we're unmerciful. Sometimes we're hard-hearted. We're more interested in winning than promoting peace too often. But that's not who who the Lord wants us to be. That's not who he wanted the disciples to be back then. It's not who he wants us to be today. He wants us to be salt. He's saying to us, go into the world and let them see your life, and when they do, it should prove that you've been transformed by me. I'll take an amen there. I mean, I think that's worthy of an amen. That's what the Lord wants from us. If you're simply putting on the flavor of the Lord without truly surrendering to, his cha- to the Lord, Jesus, the change agent, it's going to become very obvious. As it did with my friend Heather, <laughs> it'll become obvious. When you surrender, he's going to make you useful. He's going to make you an enhancement to those you are around. And he's going to, he's going to, you're going to attract people who are looking for flavor in their lives too. They're going to want to talk to you. They're going to want to hear about this Jesus because they're going to see something. They're going to see that life change in you. I think that's what we want, friends, isn't it? People are looking for something real, maybe more than ever before. There's nothing more, nothing more real than a relationship with Jesus. And we have the opportunity to be those who share it as salt. Let's move on to light. Let me remind you of what we read earlier. You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Now, the common first century lamp, and I brought one with me actually, is this is not from the first century, but it is exactly what it would have looked like. It's very small. You see, I wanted to bring it, I wanted to put it in my hand so you could see how small it is. Why? Well, fuel back then was expensive, kind of like today, right? So we don't like to waste it. So the oil would go in here, the wick would be lit, lit and then the idea of putting on a stand in a room brings light to that room. And if, you, if you've been to Israel, you know that so often it's a one-room house or maybe a one-room house with an outdoor kitchen and not a lot of light even able to come in. So you put it on the stand. But I wanted to show you this just so you could see this, how small a lamp would be. We've all experienced that moment when, in a literal way, light has opened up darkness to us, right? Can you think of a time when you needed a flashlight really badly? Or the power went out and you lit a candle and all of a sudden, boom. Any, any of that, I'm afraid I'm going to trip over something moment, it's, it's gone. I, I, I've never been um, a sailor, but I, I imagine, I imagine a, a ship ca- captain at night lo- lost their way in a storm and then all of a sudden, from out of the gloom, boom, the lighthouse appears. I can imagine how, what a relief that would be. As with salt, Jesus knew that what he was saying to us, be light, was pretty much impossible on our own. We know that we're supposed to be bringing light to the world. We know that. It's, it's so clear in Scripture. But through our own effort, it can seem very daunting, can seem very challenging. But that's where Jesus really steps in. He is the source of the light that's meant to to shine in and through us. I think you know this, but let me remind you. He can do, he can be and do so much more through you than you can be or do by yourself. Isn't that true? What he can do through you, so much more powerful 
than what you can do on your own. Jesus is the light of the world. Why wouldn't we want him to reflect through us? Scripture tells us in John 8, 12, these are Jesus' words, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And good deeds flow from that transformation, from the light being reflected in and through me. That's where the good deeds flow from. And those are where the real good deeds come from because they are, they're less motivated by self and more, they're more, more motivated by the Lord. Less of me, more of you, Lord. That's when this starts to begin, when we allow the Lord to do that transformational work. When I think about light or light on a hill, I automatically, my mind automatically goes to Waterbury. Not just because there's a cross on the hill that you see, but because of a, a season that I went through as a campus pastor when I was out in Waterbury. The Waterbury congregation used to set up and tear down in a, in a school for quite a few years. And after a while, we started to pray a prayer. I actually went back to, to, to see what the prayer was exactly. And these were the words that we had written kind of everywhere. God, please provide your gift regarding our future church location. Very simple, but we prayed it consistently in every prayer gathering, probably almost every week in, from the front. We were praying for it. Lord, we don't, we don't know how this is going to happen. We don't have a lot of money to do it, but we, we believe you want to you plant us somewhere. So then I used, to, um, I used to coach soccer, which is kind of a joke in and of itself, but don't laugh. And I would stand in a park across the street from a church. Here's the photo coming up. And I, and I would look at this church across the street, and I would wonder, what is going on there? You can see the park there, and then you can see the church over on the hill. And we'll zoom in on the church. And I found out what was going on in there. And I, I saw this church. It was a church on a hill. It was a church in this neighborhood it was across from a park, and to make a very long story short, it was given to us. Given to us. Yeah, you can clap. It's pretty awesome. One of, the, uh, one of the people that was advising some of the church leadership there said this to their leadership, and it was kind of a turning point, as you can imagine. She said, if Jesus had a building that his people needed, wouldn't he give it to them? And the people of Bunker Hill Congregational Church we sat across the table and we literally slid a check for a dollar across the table for that building. I share that to you because this, this building, this location has become salt and light in a community. Do you know that we've literally had young people, uh, youth, walk off the streets into this facility and give their lives to Jesus on the spot, on multiple occasions? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I love it. It's become a, tr a trusted community center, a center where people can come and meet Jesus, and that's what's happening. It's just an example of salt and light, how a church can be salt and light. And I want to show you one other short video here. It's just going to be in the background as I'm sharing with you. You're going to see a place. Uh, this is the Bay of Bengal in Bangladesh. You're seeing a mud island that might be one of the most spiritually dark places I've ever been. The entire island is a brothel and its inhabitants are being trafficked in the sex trade. But there you see in white medical coats the, the uh, Christian Service Society workers, some of whom have been redeemed from being trafficked on that island, and they're providing health care for the victims of the atrocities that happen there every single day. And our church in action support keeps that clinic open, friends. We're caring for the most vulnerable by helping them care for the most vulnerable. We're bringing light into very dark places. Now, that's exciting that we can do that. And I'm telling you, you might even feel some of that, the, that, 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 that emotion from just seeing it because it's that dark a place. But the Lord wants to step in and you think about that flashlight when the lights are out and bring light to dark places. And we get to be a part of that together, friends, here at Walnut Hill. But it's not just about a church being salt and light, is it? There's an individual call for each of us. There's an individual call on what it means to be salt and life, light for each of us. So I want to ask just a couple of questions as we close, and I'll invite the, the team to come back up as I finish here. First is this. Have you been transformed into salt and light by the only one who can do that work in your life? 
In other words, have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Whether you're you're at home right now or you're here live in this room, have you done that? Have you got to the place in your journey where you've said to the Lord, no longer do I want to rule and reign in my life, I want you to rule and reign. Everyone who, who came here, and I believe this truly, came here with some needs. Whether you're tuned in or you're here in the room, you came with some needs. And one of those needs that I think is universal, that we all come with when we come to church, is that need of being able to know that it's not just our effort. Like we're trying so hard to be good. Like we want to be, we want to be who God wants us to be. We're trying so hard. But one of the things that you may not have known, but you need to know, is that you don't have to try hard to be loved by the Lord. You don't have to even be a good person. The Lord says he comes for the sick, for the lost, for the hurting. Friends, even today, you can allow Jesus to come and rule and reign and change your life. And I would encourage you not to wait another moment. That's the first and most important question. Today, reach out to a prayer servant here. If you're online, reach out to a prayer servant online. Take that major step. Here's a difficult question, I think, but one we need to ask. Are you living a phony, pseudo-Christian life? Do you sprinkle on the salt when it's convenient? Is your light just a flicker and you know it? I want to encourage you, just like I got confronted by a friend that, and it changed my life, I hope I can be a friend to you today and confront you and say, turn around from it. Repent of that. Go a different direction. Stop with the lukewarmness. Recommit your life to Jesus or commit it for the very first time. He wants to use you for his glory for his purposes. And friends, you are missing out on what God would want to do in and through you. And then finally, are you going further with Jesus than you ever have before? We're going to be saying those words a lot in the next few months. Jesus is saying to you, be useful. Be an enhancement to all the environments that I put you in. Are you? Are you useful? Are you flavorful in the communities he's putting you in? He says, let my light shine through your actions and be a reflection of me. That's what Jesus says to us. Are you allowing him to shine brightly through your life? Friends, this requires something simple but profound, a daily laying down of yourself and asking the Lord to come and rule and reign and move through you. See, the Lord has a part for each of us to play. He does. He has a part for you to play. I want to, I, I just, I just want to, I hope that you will find that you are able to be salt and light this week as he empowers you to be, as you surrender to him more fully, as you continue on the journey of going further with Jesus than you ever have before. Will you stand with me as we pray? Lord God, it's, it's been my hope that this, this sermon would be challenging, but that it would also be empowering to know that it's, it's, not, it's not just me and my strength, but it's you and your strength through me. God, you've got great things for this church to do. And we highlighted a couple of those things you've already done and, and are doing, but you also have great things to do f- through us as individuals in the lives you've placed us in, in the places that I can't go where someone else can go, whether it's their school, whether it's their workplace, their home, their neighborhood. Lord, you've planted us in places to be salt and to be light. God, may we do it well. And where we are failing, Lord, give us the strength to turn around and change. Give us the strength to be the men and the women that you are designing us to be. Surrender to you and on a mission for you. In Jesus' name, amen.